Good afternoon, and welcome to today's episode of Uniting for Workplace Equity, a partnered effort between the Employee Rights Center and the Kim Center for Social Balance. I'm Dr. Heo Kim, Executive Director of the Kim Center. We're a nonprofit dedicated to accelerating workplace equity for all employees through data-driven collaborative efforts. We are grateful to the Employee Rights Center for hosting this series, and with me is their director, Alor Calderon. Hi, hey, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, new episode of this very important, um, you know, uh, series of discussions, Uniting for Workplace uh, Unity, or uh, uh, our, sorry, I'm, I'm mis, mis, uh, stating the title of the, of the series. Help me out, hey, what is the title of the series? Uh, workplace Equity. <laughs> Workplace equity. Oh, I, but I think it's United. It used to be a different title, but anyways. So workplace unity, and we are a big supporter of the work of the Kim Center and uh, what uh, Dr. Kim is uh, doing. Uh, we believe every day in our in our daily interaction with workers, and a lot of them, a majority actually, are women workers. That we don't have the kind of workplaces that we need in order to have the successful, thriving community that we need, and perhaps the most important factor is that we do not treat women um, as first-class citizens. We treat them as second-class citizens. And nothing can be clearest. The shows in every one of our workplaces that we ever been to is that how is a maternity, childcare, and issues related to school, which by the way, going and visiting your professor or your teacher, sorry, your teachers at primary school is in the labor code. You're supposed to give person permission to go and visit their, their teacher under the labor code. Nobody gets that permission. I've been working at the Employer Rights Center for 17 years. I've never heard it once in my life. Why? It's because that's associated with a certain gender. It's because that's associated with a certain part of our workforce. We do not have that in the center of our discussion of what does it mean to be a better region, a thriving community. We, this is why we work uh, with Dr. Kim. This is why we are supportive of this kind of discussion. So welcome, so, so needed. Um, Thanks for being here, and hopefully you'll have a great discussion today. Sorry, new technology. <laughs> Thank you, Alor. Um, and yes, you, you hit the nail on the head about women still having second class status. And that is the reason that um, everything associated with women is also considered as uh, uh, having secondary importance. Um, right now, our culture normalizes lower representation, respect, and reward for women than men. We saw some grueling statistics come out of the pandemic. If we have ever lessons to learn, this would be the time. In San Diego, a quarter of mothers, 25%, stopped doing paid work because of the lack of childcare, compared to what percent of fathers? 9%. And about 12%, which is 535 San Diego childcare providers closed their doors, uh, creating an affordable childcare desert around the county. Not that the desert is affordable, but a <laughs> desert of affordable childcare um, around the county. What we haven't documented though, is all the ways that we can do something about it. So the Kim Center is piloting, piloting an historic initiative called LEAPS in San Diego to unite community leaders around this data-driven collaborative change. Today, we're talking with four subject matter experts to demonstrate what these open dialogues can look like, how they can represent the interests of their stakeholder groups, and how we can fuel joint efforts that lead to more powerful solutions than siloed efforts ever could. Now I'd like to welcome and thank our very talented and notable panelists. Vice Chair Vargas, thank you for being here. She represents San Diego County District 1. She's the first ever Latina, binational, and woman of color to serve as supervisor in San Diego. Nora sits on numerous boards and commissions, including as co-chair of the county's COVID-19 subcommittee, the California State Association of Counties, and the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. Welcome. Molly Kirkland is Public Affairs Director for the Southern California Rental Housing Association. She previously worked at the San Diego Association of Realtors and also served under California State Assemblymember Howard Wayne. 
originally from San Diego's South Bay, Molly enjoys working for the betterment of the region. We also have Caddy Ibarra, who is director of the San Diego and Imperial Women's Business Center, hosted by Southwestern College. Caddy, uh, she works tirelessly to secure women's economic justice and entrepreneurial opportunities. Caddy also owns a binational marketing firm with more than 15 years of experience in small business and marketing strategies. Dr. Tina No Bartel is director of the Center of Excellence for the San Diego and Imperial Counties Community Colleges. She oversees regional data and research initiatives that support the 10 community colleges with evidence-based decision-making. Tina also previously served on the Kim Center's Research Advisory Committee. Thank you all for being here. And for those of you in the audience just joining us, we are talking with legislative business and research leaders about how open dialogue and collaborative effort can increase childcare options in San Diego. I invite you to add your questions to the chat and we will address them at the end. So I'm gonna start with Tina. Can you help us set the stage with some highlights from your and, uh, and or other research on childcare in San Diego? Yes, thank you for having me. Let me share with you just a couple of data points from our research partners in the region. It's actually, the topic has actually been researched quite a bit these past couple of years since we knew that child care has become a major issue, not only in San Diego County, but across the whole state, as well as the whole nation. So let me share with you so far, here are some data points that hopefully will set the stage for our conversation. Our partners found that approximately 30% to 40% actually of a family's income is spent on child care costs. And as Dr. Kim mentioned, nearly 2,000 child care spots were lost in San Diego County since the start of the pandemic. When we look at the numbers specifically and identify all the children underneath five, let's assume that if all of them wanted a licensed spot, a spot in a licensed facility, one in two children would not have a spot. So let me repeat that. One in two children, if they wanted a spot in San Diego child care license, let's say not um, if there were any family members or other caregiving opportunities, they would not have a spot in San Diego's child care uh, desert. So that's what our partners identified. And my role for the community colleges is to provide data and research to help them develop their training programs that meet employers' workforce needs and that serve our community. So I serve these 10 community colleges through the COE at the Center of Excellence. And we did a research report for our child care develop child development early. Uh, care education programs. It is arguably one of our most popular programs in the community college system. Of the 100,000 students that enrolled in career technical education programs or career education programs in the region, about 12% of them enroll into child development programs. However, when they graduate from our child development programs, approximately 26% attain a living wage. So this is a challenge that we came across, even though it's an essential program, a necessary program, the difficulty is that when our students graduate, the job opportunities out there are limited in terms of getting living wages. So we were asked to conduct a study and we surveyed over 300 uh, child care providers and we conducted 18 interviews with them to get more detailed information. And I'll only share a couple of findings with you today because we want to hear from our other panelists, but essentially, not surprisingly, there is a strong demand for new centers and business owners in the region. So the recommendation from the report is that we need to focus on building entrepreneurship into our existing popular child development programs. Primarily, these were the three areas that current business owners said they had the most difficulty with. Staff management and recruitment, clarification around licensing requirements, and business development and accounting. In the third bullet point, essentially a lot of the business owners said they need help finding financial assistance in order to keep their business afloat. The margins are very thin. During the pandemic, several of them, several business owners had to cut their own salaries in order to make ends meet. So these are the three areas that we recommend to the community colleges to adopt in our existing child development programs. The second challenge that this report addressed addresses is that employers basically have difficulty finding candidates with prior experience working with children. 
It is surprising the number of job candidates that apply for childcare facilities that don't have formal working experience with children. The perception versus the actual experience that is needed in a childcare facility is totally different. So in the survey that we conducted with these childcare providers, 260 of them said that they were interested in providing work-based learning opportunities with the community colleges. Work-based learning is essentially our term for internships, mentorships, and other on-the-job training opportunities. Over 260 of the survey respondents provided us with their contact information and said, let me partner with my local community college to provide these on-the-job child experiences with uh, the students that are in these programs. So these are some of the findings from the report and how we are using it to address and change our current existing programs to meet the needs of our region. Thank you so much for that information and that perspective, Tina. Uh, would anyone else like to comment at this point? I can comment. Uh, we are hosted at Southwestern College, and for us, it's very important to work with them. They have different programs. Um, right now, they have the Family Childcare Business Series. They cover in the first module all the steps to start the family childcare, and the Women Business Center is teaching that part and supporting the Families Studies Department. And in the next four, four modules, they cover all the child development. But it's very important to work with the college so we can offer technical assistance and no cost for them. So I only want to share that. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's really important to create that continuity of, uh, I guess, as early as, you know, starting in school and then moving into the workplace, that, that continuity of resources. Would anyone else like to contribute? Okay. I'm happy will... to contribute. Oh, so, um, you know, I, in my capacity as a supervisor, this is uh, one of my priorities, right? Knowing that uh, particularly women and women of color are, are impacted by the lack of access uh, to childcare. And so I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Tina and to Kathy and all the folks that are doing the research and the data, because it's so important to have the correct data points for policymakers to be able to make the decisions uh, in terms of how do we move forward. Um, just last week, we had a child um, conference, child care uh, conference at the Board of Supervisors. It was the first one of its kind with board members. We had uh, different uh, representatives uh, share some of the challenges. And one of the conversations, uh, one of the items that I brought up was this idea of the concept of entrepreneurship, right? We talk about childcare and uh, sometimes you forget that we need to find ways to make sure that um, that we create opportunities for, for the workforce uh, to be able to provide this help, this um, care for our children. And, uh, you know, uh, there's, the points that were made today, the three points about making sure, you know, that people not having access to to uh, the operations piece or resources, that's exactly what came out uh, last week. And so my goal is that as we're moving forward and hearing from all of you, we're able to not only identify additional policy initiatives, but also think about what do we do with the federal and state legislation uh, to ensure that we are really thinking about it from, uh, from this perspective of the entrepreneurship piece of it versus only we need to make sure we get health care for everyone because uh, as one woman mentioned in her in her in her presentation she says you know it's hard for me to be able to put a child care center when rent continues to go up and I, I don't have the capital to buy a house to be able to do it but when I'm able to do it in my home with a certain amount of, of young kids then it allows for me to be able to be a business person take care of the children and then also uh you know have the stability that i need to be able to you know care for my family and so i think there's a lot of ripple effects from this and i'm really uh, looking forward to additional conversation with all of you on it thank you so much for that perspective and uh you know on the heels of all your comments there how much more child care avail availability should san diego ideally aim for and what are you know, this is how you get people to listen, right? What are the broader economic and or social impacts of not getting it? 
Well, I mean, the ideal capacity in a society, I, I think authentically would support working parents and caregivers, and we would have licensed slots for all children in diverse settings to meet the family needs, um, schedules, cultural responsiveness, education type, location. Uh, to meet that scenario, we need about, what, 74,000 slots. Uh, so I think we, we are in, you know, I think it should be our goal right um but i figure I, to me it's how do we get there right i mean child care has a substantial impact on economic development i think uh, many parents have to choose between being forced to remain out of the labor force in order to remain at home with the child or some families may be postponing not having children as well and so um, i think for me it's really looking at it from what is the current availability of care uh and how do we create an economic impact that includes um you know absenteeism and a lot of toxic stress on families that can lead to adversity for kids. One of the folks who spoke at this conference last week also talked about, you know, it's a really wonderful opportunity to create uh, retention programs in, in our uh, for employees. And there's some people who are doing it very well, right? And, and so um, it, I think it's important for all of us to really begin to think outside the box because we know that women represent nearly half of the US workforce they still devote more time than men to the average uh, to housework and health care and a uh, few hours to work. So although the gap has narrowed significantly over time, I think in order for us to have economic prosperity, childcare has to go hand in hand. Businesses rely on employees and employees rely on childcare. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to keep moving forward. And uh, our goal should be that it's available for all and that it's accessible, that it's safe, and uh, we're making sure that that uh, you know funding is not the issue of why people can't access it. Yes, thank you. Sorry, my. I, I also want to share that uh, the Women Business Center we have the we have a strong partnership with Chicano Federation, and we offer the eight week program on how to start your family childcare. This program covers all the licensing part and give the specific tools that they need to be successful, the marketing part, the financial part. But we know that the financial part is crucial because we know that some of them, they are making even. So we want to address that. So that's why it's very important to, to teach the financial part. And, and give that education to, to childcare providers. Yes, thank you. Would anyone else, Vice Chair Vargas? You know, I was just gonna say that I was, uh, thank you, Kathy, for that. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned, you know, so I was a trustee at Southwestern College for uh, about seven years before I became a supervisor. And so childcare was always, um, you know, key. It's one of the, one of the, I think, biggest, secrets that Southwestern College has that few people know about and um, the work that they're doing with the Chicano Federation. Uh, and remind me what the name is, it's, it's in Spanish, right? Uh, what is the program called? The la, Inicia Tu Guardería en Casa. Hi, Inicia Tu Guardería en Casa. So begin your, your own child care, uh, you yeah. know, at your home. And the, the beauty of it is, is it's in language, it's culturally appropriate. And I think that's the piece that I, I wanna make sure we don't lose track of that because um, you know, childcare is expensive. It, it's, it's difficult for parents sometimes to be able to access it. And you know, if, well, if we can, if I think one thing that we can do well is how do we make sure that the richness of our communities is really embedded in the curriculum and the training and, and how we're ensuring that our young people, our young kids are gonna have that exposure so that they feel like at their home, right? They're, they're home and they're learning and they're uh, going to be good. Uh, you know, they're gonna be able to develop uh, their their um, strengths in terms of their bicultural or any, any of the communities that we serve here in District 1. That's a really good point. Um, Caddy, the supervisor said that an ideal number would be 74,000 slots. What is the potential for new childcare entrepreneurs to fill that need? So we offer the program and in our program, we offer around eight to nine cohorts a year with 25 people attending the class. 
But at the end, when they need to apply for the license, not, of, not all of them are ready because uh, they need more financial uh, support. Just an example, to have ready a family childcare, they need to set up the place, uh, have all the arrangements done before to get the inspection from the state. So they need to invest in their business without knowing if they are gonna have the state license, if they are gonna be approved. So that's one of the issues that they are having. And another big issue, uh, most of our clients are very low income uh, women of color. And another uh, um, problem that they are facing is the uh, permission from the housing provider. So Molly, I, I want to ask you, uh, how can we uh, collaborate so our clients have that permission from, from their housing provider? Because uh, some of them, they need to wait a long time just to get one, um, to, to get that rental that they are going to allow them to have this uh, type of uh, business in their home. Yeah, happy to kind of talk about that a little bit. And thank you for including uh, me in this. I, I feel like I'm going to learn a lot more in this process than I'm probably going to be able to teach. But I will say from the housing provider side of things, it's not really a choice uh, the way we see it. Uh, it is in state law that you know, a, a renter has a right to operate this kind of facility from their rental unit. And while is it ideal to communicate and have a back and forth and, and you know, get that approval, so to speak? Um, sure. But it's not like you can be denied housing or you can be evicted or anything like that because you choose to operate a, a child care facility. And so I think like with most things, you know, especially now out of the pandemic at the risk of being cliche, it's all about communication and education and outreach. And, and people, you know, sometimes don't know what they don't know. And so from our side of things, when we are offering advice to our members who may not have experienced a situation where they've been asked uh, um, or told that a child care facility is going to be operated, it's letting them know this is somebody's right. They can actually go forth and do this without your permission, I believe. However, by including you know, some, a form that simply kind of outlines what's going to happen, you know, within 30 days, you can get this facility up and running. And again, I really think it's just about educating the housing provider community and letting also, you know, renters know that this isn't something that they can say no to. And if, it, you know, I, it, and I will say in my role, um, it's not something we hear about a lot and certainly not as a problem. Usually our members call and say, what's the law on this? What do I need to do? Then they say, okay, great. Here's the form. I'll get it done. And, and we don't hear any complaints from that point on. And I, and I think that is a good sign. And I can elaborate on that later at some point, but to say that we don't hear complaints from our members about anybody who's operating a childcare facility in their units, typically, I think just speaks to how this can be a benefit for everybody involved beyond just, you know, who the provider of the childcare, beyond the housing provider, but even for other residents in the community, you've got now somebody operating a business who is licensed, who probably is going to take extra care to make sure that they're handling things properly. And even more than that, imagine if you've got, you know, neighbors with children who can have their children be in that facility. I mean, that just takes the, the kind of the sense of community to the next level. So again, I think, you know, from our end, it's really about education and I, collaboration. So I would love to keep this relationship going and finding out where there's hiccups in the process and how we can make sure that housing providers, whether our members or not, are aware of kind of the laws surrounding this and, and how this is an overall community benefit. I think that's really um, powerful because, you know, even as we're building homes, right, why not one of the biggest priorities that we have is making sure that everybody's housed, right? We are trying to address the, the unsheltered population and in, in trying to ensure that people have access to housing, um, one of the things that we have heard from, especially the, the folks who, some of the developers that are trying to build more homes, um, that when they're trying to do infield, it's really hard because the tax 
uh, child care is not a component of, of them being able to do the formula so that they are able to provide, uh, so that they can get the credits that they need. And so I think working in, together to try to figure out how do we create these policies that are not, that are actually helping the environment, helping our families, and at the same time, uh, we are able to build uh, homes that are going to uh, also have these child care centers that people can have access to. And, you know, I've thought about, you know, like the way we did with, for instance, if you look at Mikos and two different concepts, right, but Mikos is being able to have, um, you know, small, you know, restaurants and folks being able to cook and to do different things, thinking outside the box, right, so that people can have their own small businesses. Imagine if we had centers within like rental housing units where like there are community centers that, you know, you can rent out to community members so that they can actually provide the services there, right? I mean, imagine, like, I think we need to start thinking outside the box. It can't just be, um, oh, well, let's figure out where the child care center is close by. But if a housing unit has it and they have a community center, imagine if they rent out that space or that space, you know, let's say government rents it out to community so that they can have the child care there. I don't know. Those are kind of things that I've just been trying to think about outside the box about how do we incentivize these opportunities um, so that more people will be able to rent your homes because they have access to somebody to take care of their kids. They can go to work. People can pay their rent. And so I think it's a win-win situation for everyone. Um, but but I do think that we're going to have to think outside the box about how we're doing this, uh, particularly as women are trying to reenter the workforce after COVID. So many women were displaced. Um, and so as we're moving forward, how do we do that? And how do we think outside the box? Well, Nora, I love that you bring that up because that actually kind of segues into our next question, um, which had originally be framed, was framed as what are some other obstacles the county has become aware of to childcare entrepreneurs and how is it managing them? But it seems like you're taking a very productive approach from the other side of, well, what are we not considering that we could be considering that's new? Um, is the county in general having this conversation about what are some other ways that we could consider implementing? Absolutely, and like I mentioned, right, we had our first childcare um, conference last week to begin to have these discussions. But, you know, when you're thinking about, I mean, what is it, about 4,000 facilities closed due to COVID and in San Diego County, I think, and I think it was mentioned right now, right? One in eight uh, children, right? There's, the centers were closed. And so they hit most of the vulnerable neighborhoods the hardest. And so we need to really be looking at how do we make sure we're providing that childcare providers in low-income areas who lost their clients or they were laid off, um, you know, are able to take, get back uh, on their feet. I think one of the things that I'm really grateful for was the Biden administration and ARPA funding. They were very creative about making sure that, and it was important for them, I, I guess, uh, I would say that, that child care was a component of it, right? And so we took a really, we made it a priority for us as a board of supervisors. We took action. We allocated $10 million to meet the demand immediately. So basically saying, you know, the means workforce development, increasing the pipeline, some of the conversations uh, or the, the topics that Tina was mentioning, right? Uh, supporting new childcare providers to stipends, um, additional um, certifications. Uh, we also provided, I think it was $2 million. You know, it seems like it's not a lot of money, but it was a good portion of a seed money, I would say, for operational support for existing providers. So making sure that um, biz support for the business uh, capacity building program through expansion of like so shared service alliance, uh, we also allowed for providers to get support for technology infrastructure, including facility improvements, uh, general enhancements. And then uh, for us, I think that the board also allocated 1.5 million to support childcare affordability. Um, and we provided emergency healthcare, uh, emergency childcare vouchers for families as well. So um, this is a big priority for this board. And um, in 2020, there was about 25 million that also went to childcare community through grant opportunities. So anything from like $2,750 to $50,000 for large, large licensed childcare providers. And, and I think that is the key, right? In addition to the funding investments, um, you know, and having, you know, we, we're having these conversations at a childcare conference, 
we're really trying to think about where can we as a county be the convener to bring all these experts and have these conversations to lift this issue up so that we can actually address it. Because I think as it was said in the morning earlier in the conversation, you know, when you're talking about these issues, you, we know that the majority of providers or support, you know, home care providers um, tend to be women, women of color who may not speak the language. And, and so we need to come up with a blueprint that it's intended to look at the county as a whole from a holistic perspective advocate for state and federal funding, and then making sure that we're looking at land use regulations uh, to address some of that. And so um, with our CEO, CAO, we directed her to propose some solutions. Within eight months, we're going to get a report back with recommendations regarding the county's participation with some of these um, programs. But in the meantime, we're, I mean, we're committed to making sure that we're partnering up with not only educational institutions, but with uh, the various nonprofit organizations to make sure that you know, we do this right. And then the you know, last part of it is that the county of San Diego is one of the largest employers in the region. And so we are actually looking internally and how do we support our own workforce with childcare opportunities, whether it's uh, providing onsite childcare or different stipends. Um, we can't go out and talk about what everybody else is doing if we don't take care of our own home and really take care of our employees because uh, I think it's important. And I will leave you with, with this part, right? That what we have found particularly like for nurses, uh, for um, our correctional officers, some of the folks who work, you know, our janitors, folks who work very different hours that are not your regular nine to five hours, we really need to think about what that looks like. It can't be this idea that, okay, childcare, seven o'clock and 10 o'clock and I mean, at five o'clock and then it's over, right? I mean, people have different hours of operations and, you know, we're looking at these models of, can you drop off your child in, in you know, later on in a safe, secure space, where um, a mom who's a nurse can actually go, you know, to her overnight, you know, um, uh, you know, profession, and or a sheriff, for instance. And right now, there's not a lot of opportunities, especially like if they're detectives and they have to do things last minute, you know. So we have a lot of those employees in our county that we really are trying to think about how do we do this and how do we do this in a way that it's accessible, affordable, and safe for everyone. Thank you. That's all really inspiring and, and fantastic to hear. Would anyone else like to comment? I also want to comment that at the William Business Center, we offer free technical assistance because we noticed that, uh, especially with the report that uh, Dr. Kim was assisting us, that most of uh, women of color didn't apply or were denied to get access to grants. So that is another uh, big issue that um, they don't speak the, the language, uh, they don't have their financial ready. So all that um, builds uh, walls and, and prevent them to access to capital. So at the William Business Center, we are here to help them at no cost for them. And, and they can book an appointment at our website and we can assist them through all the process from the creating uh, the business, um, create, grow and expand the business and even access to capital. So if they know of a grant, uh, we can help them to fill out all the application and, and check their financials so they have everything ready. Thank you. If For I'm those of you who are, oh, please, Molly. I was just going to say, I think that that support is crucial. I mean, in, in lots of spaces, right, but especially here. And if there's anything that we can do to partner to provide information, you know, specific to rental housing, we would love to do that. Absolutely. That's a great idea. Yeah. That's what we want to hear. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Molly. Uh, and for those of you who are just joining us, we're here with County Supervisor Nora Vargas, Dr. Tina Bartel, Caddy Ibarra, and Molly Kirkland, brainstorming about how stakeholder collaboration can increase child care availability in San Diego. We'd love to see your questions in the chat. If you don't put them in now, please feel free to put them in later when we post them and we will address them. Uh, Nora, I know you have to leave at some point, so feel free to just do so when you need to. But in the meantime, I definitely want to hear your perspectives on the other questions. So my next question is for Molly. 
we found that in some of our research, in some cases related to work, some I issues related to workplace equity, for example, union members had fewer challenges than the population at large. This could be a case with your members. Your members are getting the education that they need. And so you're not hearing the complaints that, um, that we know do happen in other areas around the county. So how might you provide or help to provide this kind of education to non-member housing providers? You touched on this a little before. Um, and what do you see as more needing to be done? Thank you. That's a it's a great question, and I usually joke whenever I have a, a an elected official or legislator <laughs> in the in the room that the first thing you could do is mandate that they all join my association. <laughs> that would make you know things so much easier. But of course, we can't do that. And so I think really it comes down to collaboration and partnering with groups. Maybe you know one could argue that. This may not be, you know, your traditional kind of partnership or, you know, rental housing organization and folks dealing with women in business and childcare, but it's a perfect example of where there should be a partnership. Because the only way you can reach groups kind of beyond your sphere is to engage other groups and to work with them. And so, you know, there's that as a first step. But I also think we as an association, we have a duty and we do this um, to do outreach to non-members whenever we can. And, you know, if they join our association, that's great because now they're part of a group that, you know, we lead with professionalism and, and compliance with laws and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, even if they don't join, maybe we can remind them of some things that they weren't aware of, you know, the, the kind of did you knows list, and they may not know that somebody has a right to operate a child care facility in their rental unit, and they may go do the research or, you know, and find out a little bit more. And so even if it doesn't, you know, yield what you know, some might say are these grand results, even by just putting that kind of, you know, buzz in somebody's ear could lead them to seek out more information. And like I said, you know, if, if there's no kind of magic bullet for any of this, but we've got to take baby steps and partnerships like this and working with groups kind of beyond our traditional, you know, partnerships is really the only way I think we're going to kind of get the word out there more. And I think, um, you know, there's ways that we can structure the information, and, and I know Heyo and I were having this conversation last week, that there are benefits to having a child care operator in your rental uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, they are, that's income, one, so, you know, there's less concerns about whether or not somebody could pay rent. If you want to, you know, look at it from the business perspective. Um, these folks are licensed, you know, and, you know, quite often you have people running businesses out of their homes who shouldn't be or and they don't necessarily take the same care when they're operating that business and and nobody who has gone through the exercise and the time and effort to get a license which i'm learning seems to be you know more of a hurdle than i knew is going to do anything to put that in jeopardy it creates a sense of community like i said you know i, I don't have children of my own but i do remember you know to the supervisor's point those times where uh, my nieces and nephews, you know, their daycare was closed on a holiday, but my brother and sister-in-law had to work and I was able to step in and help and watch the kids. But there's people's schedules who don't necessarily follow the traditional nine to five, you know, Monday through Friday. And if your other residents have the ability to make sure they can go to work and not have to worry about child care, again, that just makes sure that everybody can fulfill kind of, you know, the financial components, which you hate for it to come back to. But when we're worrying about people possibly being displaced or anything like that, it really is becomes this big kind of ecosystem where we need to worry about these other things that take people away from their jobs or what have you. And so I think there's ways is that we can approach this a little bit differently. And, you know, like, like I said, we typically deal in just, you know, what's the law, what's your rights and responsibilities, but look at it from a more holistic approach. And this is how, you know, it can be a win, 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 maybe even another win for everybody involved. And so, but, you know, just to reiterate, whatever we can do to help, you know, um, put that information out there, especially to folks, again, who aren't necessarily our members and may not have access to this information, we're happy to, to do whatever we can. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, if they become our members, even better, and we can make sure that they don't run afoul of anything. <laughs> Thank you so much. You, you raised a lot of compelling points that really can provide 
the foundation for educational programs, presentations, interactions. Uh, Nora, do you have uh, something you'd like to contribute? Yeah, so I, I think that to your point, uh, Molly, I think it's that piece of really the 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 thinking outside the box, right? In order for us to address childcare, it's going to take a public private partnerships, and that everybody has a role to play. Um, education, the private sector, and and really, I think I would say that um, you know we need to begin to elevate this issue as a priority for our communities. This is not about like, oh, childcare is only an issue for women who are who have kids or only for people who are of varying age. I mean, no, this is it's a society, so it's a societal responsibility to ensure uh, that our young people, our kids um, have the tools that they need, right? Because if you go back and you think about, you know, the whole conversation around um, you know, preschool for all and uh, all of this, all of these policies that have been discussed for so many years, you really are talking about like, it lays the foundation for those that have and those that don't have, right? If you have access to funding and resources, you put your kids in Montessori classes or you put them in a private class with somebody who's teaching them languages and all that stuff. And you, you start them off at a very early young age, you know, two years old, three years old, four years old. So by the time they get to first grade, they're competitive. And they're like, you know, they're in a whole different level of reading, writing and, and um, the way they, they communicate, et cetera. And I think we need to give that opportunity to all children. And, and as a society, we have a responsibility to do that and do that well, like I said, in an affordable, safe and healthy way. And it doesn't matter what your zip code is, you should be able to have access to help, to, to, help, to, to care, childcare. Um, and your parents shouldn't have to be worried about like, oh my God, I have to go here or I have to go there. Because if you think about it, right? As I, I was saying during the conversation last week at the, at the county, if you think about a parent who doesn't have a car, who has to get on a bus, you think about how far it is to get, like, just, I always explain San Isidro, right? You know, everybody knows where San Isidro, California is, right, right on the border, right? And you think about going to Chula Vista. Chula Vista is the second largest uh, city in the county of San Diego. If you try to get on a bus, it takes you about an hour and 15 minutes to get from point A to point B. So imagine if your job is in Chula Vista, you live in San Isidro, and you, it's not just one stop, but you have to change two buses in order to get to, to uh, like Southwestern College, for instance, which is like, you know, further away. Um, how do you get your child to childcare, right? If you don't have a car, how do you do that? And, and how do you make sure that you balance that out? So either the, the childcare is going to be near your home or near your work. It can't be in the middle because what do you do? And, you know, we're working on transportation. We can have a whole other panel on that discussion. Uh, transportation justice is key to this work as well, but I think we as policymakers in partnership with community really need to look at this as a priority because it really is also part of, of economic innovation and invest, investing in the future of our, of our community. So um, I really appreciate that you're having this discussion. I'm sorry that I have to step out, but but again, uh, I, I, I know this is the beginning of many conversations. It's absolutely a priority for me um, and particularly with my, my team and our County of San Diego, making sure that we do this and do it the best that we can. And enough, uh, with all due respect, enough creating more reports and all of that. We have the data, we know what the issues are. Let's figure out the solutions that are really gonna have a long-term impact in our communities. Here, here. And that is exactly where we're going with our, our LEAPS playbook to uh, bring all the different stakeholders together. Thank you so much for your time you. and your contributions. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, Tina, I'd like to direct this last question to you. Uh, you touched earlier on what community colleges can do to increase the, the success of the future childcare workers coming through their programs. Um, if you could talk more about that and, and maybe think creatively about how that can be. And Katty, you started, you jumped in with a few things too. How can more conversations with um, housing providers or housing provider associations and women business centers increase the effectiveness of what they, uh, what community colleges can offer? Yeah, let me touch uh, what some of the panelists were hinting to. Basically a childcare center is a small business. And I think that when we talk about childcare, we don't think of it 
as often as a business that needs the same kind of support and resources that other small businesses in San Diego County needs. 95% of our businesses have less than five employees. And so the community colleges are taking a step in the right direction to incorporate entrepreneurship in their training. And so that will help increase the number of child care, licensed child care spots for children. However, that's only one piece of the equation. What about the students that don't want to become entrepreneurs or realize that that's not the pathway to them? They are still facing that issue of getting low wages once they finish from the program. And we're having a huge problem right now because students will go through training and realize they're not going to make a living wage. So they drop out because Target will pay way above the living wage just to get you to work at a retail store. And that is a huge issue. So we're trying to figure out by working with private sector, how we can increase wages. One of the discussions I had last week at, the, at a state conference with the community college is that one of the attendees didn't understand why supply and demand did not affect the childcare industry. A lot of parents have a demand for childcare. Wouldn't that increase the wages of the folks that work in the childcare centers? It's not that simple. Like the restaurant industry, margins are very thin. And there is a regulatory compliance component to it where there's a certain ratio of instructors to students or children that come through the center. So with all of this going on, child care providers are scrambling to figure out how to run a business, how to get funding, how to write and respond to regulatory compliance administrative work, and also trying to hire people. So the community college is what Supervisor Vargas mentioned earlier, is trying to work in a systemic, uh, systemic level where we're working with private, uh, private sector, public sector, as well as all of the community partners that are interested in this topic to figure out another way to support the industry and their workers. One of the things that we talked about frequently is that in other countries, childcare is subsidized and childcare workers are elevated at a level where they're almost seen as highly uh, sought after like medical professionals. And yet in our culture, in our in our communities, child care providers are probably not even seen at that level of importance. And so how do we change that by having these discussions and trying to find other funding sources that can sustain the folks that are running their, their businesses, their small businesses in the region, and also be able to pay living wages in our region. So these are all conversations that the community colleges are having. Simply changing our instructional practices and our curriculum is again just one piece of the, the puzzle. The bigger issue at hand is that unless we can raise those wages and have society view child care workers as a highly sought after profession, we're going to continue to have this problem. Absolutely hit the nail on the head. Would uh, Molly or Caddy like to, to comment on this? Um, that's why we are uh trying to collaborate with Southwestern College so we can support in the, in the entrepreneurship part. But we have also that issue with existing uh, childcare providers that they have the small license that they want to grow. It's like, okay, I cannot afford to pay an assistance or, or someone else to help me to grow. So how can I get to that level so I can pay enough so I can maintain an assistance or someone that can help me and at the same time make a profit. So I agree, we need to, there are so many levels that we need to address uh, in this issue. Yes, thank you. And I actually love Molly, how you brought up earlier that this is something that um, housing uh, owners of housing like buildings, large buildings should welcome childcare because this is something that is within reach for a lot of residents and helps guarantee that they'll pay their rent. <laughs> so there's definitely a business advantage there. So, you know, maybe throwing that into the mix would be helpful. And also to maintain the facility in perfect mm -hmm. right. state, right. because they have, um, they have, um, surprise um, inspections, right? Inspections, yeah. so they need to have everything super clean, very neat, everything at the top, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's interesting, you know, if, hearing Tina's information about, you know, other countries, how they treat it, and I, you know, it's not my area of expertise, and this is only my personal opinion, but I do think that there's this kind of sense out there that childcare provide, oh, you're a babysitter, and, you know, 
but yet it's so in demand. And so that there's this disparity between kind of that need for it and how people view it. And I mean, so many people cannot exist without the childcare. You think like to Tina's point that more people would be willing to pay a little bit more for it and, and that there would be more of it out there that the supply and demand would, would kick in and address that. And so I it, it think that there's ways that um, the community as a whole, including you know the housing provider community could kind of approach it uh, differently to say, listen, this isn't about just somebody watching somebody's kids, <laughs> you know, because I think people like to simplify it to that. This is a, this is a, a benefit to the community, but more so it's a necessity. So society can continue to function. So this person can go to work who may, may very well, you know, service your building or, <laughs> you know, work at your grocery store, you know, everything's intertwined. And I think there needs to be kind of some, some messaging out there to, to remind folks that, you know, this impacts just about everybody. Yes, that symbiosis that you're, you're referring to is really the central issue, uh, well, around solving any problem, <laughs> but definitely it's not, I mean, when you're talking about children, which literally are our future. It is not somebody else's problem. Um, Molly, I just wanted to bring up something that you and I talked about briefly because I had heard um, that sometimes uh, housing providers are concerned about wear and tear on their facilities. And then Caddy just said, well, actually with childcare providers, there's even that extra level of, con of care and concern. Um, so that's no longer an excuse either. That's not something that can be used. And you said you have never heard that complaint. No, it's interesting. Uh, that's never come up. We hear about wear and tear a lot in other um, capacities. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I want to make it very clear. I'm in no way comparing children to animals. How, but, you know, what we hear about wear and tear about is typically pets and, and that kind of thing. What I've heard over the years with regards to child care is really it's liability you know and, and liability is always a concern whether you're operating a business running a rental property somebody gets hurt on your property or you now you're vulnerable to a loss or what have you and once we go through the steps of explaining you know what the license requires you know that this isn't just again somebody babysitting a bunch of kids um, and then we explain the form that we provide and, and the different options for you know indemnity and insurance or bond or what have you they feel extremely comfortable with the scenario. And I, I have to say, I've been at the association just over 10 years, done operational advice for a significant chunk of time. And I've never had anybody call back after the initial questioning to say they're having issues. You know, even not even noise complaints or anything like that. And, you know, and the wear and tear argument is limited, I think, um, and, and, especially since most of the time children are there in the day, you know, they're not taking a bunch of baths, <laughs> you know, making the water bill, you know, go up. And, and I got to be honest that the notion that, you know, children or even pets will cause more wear and tear is just, is, is kind of a falsehood because it really depends on the individual. You know, I've, I've heard grown adults with in professional type jobs who have done just as much damage as you know a, a dog could do right and so the the notion of wear and tear i, I don't think is as much of a concern and the liability concern seems to be fairly easy to address i really think that it's an this is a one of those issue areas where there's opportunity because there is so little i think um negative connotation that we have an opportunity to really kind of highlight all the positives and take it a step further Thank you. It's really great to have the voice of experience um, it, just saying, saying how it really is. Does anyone have any uh, comments to that point or any of the points that we addressed earlier or anything you want to bring up? I, I just want to share that I am looking forward working with you, Molly, and sending you uh, more uh, people so you can educate them. Uh, because this is our first um, issue that we have with our clients. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Tina? 
I always like to share data. So a lot of research out there has shown that a third of San Diego, a third of the income of San Diego households is attributed to housing. A third of it is to childcare if you're with a family. What do they do with the final third of their income? So this, again, as we all talked about earlier, this is a huge issue that has ripple effects in all parts of the economy because if they can reduce that one third from investing in child care, maybe that funding can go elsewhere to generate more economic activity in our region. So I just wanted to point that out that a two thirds of our income on average, San Diego households is for essential services. Right, leaving very little disposable income. Molly, do you have any final statements? You kind of made them, but. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. No, you know, I'll just say thank you for this opportunity to participate in this conversation. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a topic that I've had an opportunity to really delve into over the years. And, and unfortunately, it usually isn't until something becomes, you know, a problem, if you will, that uh, I, I get a chance to learn more about it and see how we can be a part of the solution. So just thanks for including me. I, I look forward to, you know, circling back with all of you and seeing how we can be a resource and, and and share information with our members and and really hope that you know this kind of um gets some momentum and really build on it thank you all so much and thanks to supervisor vargas as well who left us early um today for sharing generously your time your insights your experiences toward moving this conversation forward in an effective collaborative way and thank you to our audience for joining us for this episode of Uniting for Workplace Equity. We hope you'll like and share this post and add your questions or thoughts in the comments. Please stay tuned for details on our next panel and have a great day. Bye everyone.